always motivated and you're always trying to seek the new information, new things, but it's not always like you're going to be succeeding every single time. There's certainly like almost always, actually, you're probably failing and you're maybe slipping a little bit. And then that 0.1% of opportunities is right. when you, you find success. So I think that. Jay is the VP of marketing at Ava Labs and joined the team in early May 2020. For those who are new to the crypto space, Ava Labs makes it simple to launch financial applications using blockchain technology, and their flagship product is Avalanche. Okay, then what is Avalanche? It is an open source platform for launching decentralized finance applications and enterprise blockchain deployments in one interoperable, highly scalable ecosystem. Okay, you might be listening to this, but maybe it doesn't make that much sense to you. But okay, maybe some numbers might help. They rank number 15 out of all the cryptocurrencies and their fully diluted market cap is 17.1 billion as for today, June 7th. Now we went back with blockchain technology at their core of labs. Most of the companies they collaborate with fall within the blockchain industry. Decentralized finance, DeFi, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and stable coins, just to name a few. And outside of blockchain, they're also seeing a consistent growth in demand for the technology. Enterprises, institutions, and sovereign states have also connected with them to learn more about our labs and their solutions. And Future Hour has also witnessed the impact with our own eyes, especially during March and May in Barcelona and Berlin at two amazing Avalanche events. If you missed our first interview with Jay, the link is down below. Make sure you check it out and drop a comment if you like. Outside of work, Jay is a professional photographer specializing in street portrait and event photography. For events, he shoots underground music concerts all across New York City and often travel for events as well. He's extremely passionate for music and art and fashion also. And I heard that he's been producing music for the past eight years and more, primarily in techno and house music. And I think in this interview, I totally forgot to ask his SoundCloud link, but I will make sure that I follow up with him on that. With all that said, ladies and gentlemen, let's jump into the interview with Jay from Ava Labs. Jay, thank you so much for taking the time to get on this podcast. I know we've been trying to schedule this for the longest time. I just want to say that I really appreciate your time for this conversation today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a while. Yes, absolutely, definitely. So I want to jump right into it. Uh, this idea and concept, which I read it in a book before, uh, Ikigai is a Japanese concept that means your reason for being, where passion, mission, profession, and everything overlaps. Would you share with the audience what is your Ikigai and how did you find your purpose? Yeah, I think, that, I mean, I think my purpose, there's probably a variety of answers, but the one that comes most imminently um, in, in thought is really about kind of like this idea of forever learning or, or this mentality of always trying to improve. Um, I know that's very self-serving, but I think at its core, as long as you're focused on that, it tends to open up a lot of doors for, for a variety of things. So I think it's really just about the mentality. I think it's tied into work ethic. Um, if you're able to then continuously improve upon this constant strive for, for new information, new experiences, and then perfect it over time by making sure that you're able to find success, right? You're always seeking the, I guess that you're always motivated and you're always trying to seek the new information, new things, but it's not always like you're going to be succeeding every single time. There's certainly like almost always, actually, you're probably failing and you're maybe slipping a little bit. And then that 0.1% of opportunities is right. when you you find success. So I think that's, really where I start. And then with everything else I do, it really has the compounding effects. Similarly to what I said before with, with um, finding the success, but also even with anything I do at, at Ava Labs and, and just outside worlds, um, I think it's, it's a really good way to be grounded. Um, and then hopefully you can then bring that, 
I guess, um, I guess model. And, and then hopefully if you're able to maximize the chances of success over time, cause you're perfecting it, then you can make that impact externally in the world. Um, which is, I think for most people, hopefully is the, the, the end all be all effectively. So I think right now that's where I feel like I'm just starting to get my stride, like maybe walking or a little, little bit of a light jog where now you're saying like, oh, wow, like I could be doing this and I, without all of the work and effort that we put in beforehand, it, we wouldn't be at this point, but because of all of that kind of build up and foundational work, now we're able to really make larger impacts. It's kind of like when you're younger and you're saying, oh, I want to, I want to change the world. It's like, yeah, of course you do. But like, how do you get there? And so that's, that's really, I think the simple answer. Yes, absolutely. Um, really appreciate that. And I really do believe that uh, compounding the fact that one person better every day and then at the end of the year is truly just exponentially better with the arena or area you, you are picking, right? So a little bit more uh, specific question with your answer, right? Is there a routine or a schedule that you are using to make sure that you are getting that 1% uh, increasing every day? The routine is is maybe tied more high level into this concept of of dividing your life in threes. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm the first one to think about this model. It's just a simple uh, management tactic, I would say. But I remember um, kind of similar to the point of like trying to do everything and really trying to make an impact in the world. You can't possibly do everything. And that's something right. that I, I learned um, relatively recently, but also I think uh, it, it, I was fortunate enough to learn it earlier, early on in my life and especially in my career. And what right. I realized is if you do everything, you also do all of those things probably at an average level. So if you're able to put mm -hmm. focus on certain things and you're able to maybe maximize those chances of success, and then if you're able to succeed in them, maybe you can then table that and, and put that on the side and focus on another set of three items. Mm -hmm. and, and that's maybe how right. uh, it's kind of, at least for me, a better way to tackle the world. So when I describe people, what are my current threes? You have, yes. one is this, uh, my friend, um, my friend Mitchell from Immunify, actually, he, he always kind of phrases in a really funny way, but the number one pillar is you have to eat. You have to keep yourself alive. Mm -hmm. in, in, the modern, in the modern context, it's really about making money somehow through, through probably a career or some sort of profession, right? So that's yeah. number one. Mine happens to be related to crypto um, at Apple Labs. The second one is socialization. We're human beings. You need to interact with people. Otherwise, you're going to go a little bit of crazy. Um, yeah. It's just the way it is. And so for me, as, as someone who's definitely a little bit more extroverted, I really value that pretty highly. Uh, that's, that's mm -hmm. something that balances my life out quite nicely. Um, and, and again, keeps me from going a little bit insane if I wasn't especially if I wasn't seeing uh, people at all, right? Like who, who actually is, is doing that successfully, not that many. And then the third pillar, at least for me, I found is, is a way to kind of extend yourself beyond some of the mandatories. For me, it's, it's more about creative output. The creative output really balances the first pillar quite nicely, where the first pillar is more rigid thinking, more systemic, um, just kind of uh, like logical thinking because it's more marketing and, and less creative, right? There's obviously a little bit yeah. of bleed over, but more so on the other side. And then with creative, it's maybe like photography or music production where you could really just kind of have an open canvas and try and flex the other side of the brain. So hopefully if you're able to proceed correctly with this three pillar strategy, you hopefully are a little bit balanced and um, then the success should be able to come a little bit easier than if you weren't to segment it this way is, is kind of my, my take. Yes, I totally agree because there's only like 24 hours a day and uh, to be able to get all the things, all everything that we would like to um, done, whether it's like a job or spending quality time with your loved ones, spending quality time with your family and friends and also have some time for your hobby. And then it's like nearly impossible with uh, nowadays, especially for people working in the crypto industry, right? So I think, yeah, like you said, like picking three things and three areas and you really committed to them. I think those are um, super efficient. Like now all the audience out there, Atlas fan out there are going to be super excited, right? So. I saw this on LinkedIn, right? Avalab said that we're empowering people to easily and freely digitize all the world's asset on one open programmable blockchain platform, right? So how is Avalabs and Avalanche achieving this uh, stated goal here in your opinion? 
From the Avalanche Labs perspective, the first focus is as Avalanche. That's the number one priority. Avalanche needs to be as performant as possible and as easy to use as possible, both on the dev and the user side. So if you're really focused on that, the rest kind of starts to come in a little bit more easily, but still you need to do a little bit of soul searching. What areas are signifying more demand? Which ones are, are not really signaling the, the demand as much, right? Because you don't want to be putting effort into areas that aren't super fruitful or, or doesn't maximize the, the chances of success, kind of the same theme. And then beyond Avalanche, well, it's not just about the platform, right? It's also about all the different things to make the experience as easy as possible. So yeah. uh, in the past, we've put out interoperability bridges, we've put out uh, uh, like tooling, we've worked with uh, external partners to maximize their user experience on the application perspective. So yeah. all these different things are kind of like the miscellaneous bubble. And so all of that collectively put together, we're really trying to then go towards that vision of having this streamlined ecosystem, effectively, this area where you have the silos truly broken down and any type of asset can be traded with any other asset to create really create this efficient market. That's really the ultimate goal for uh, Avalabs. And then underneath it, Avalanche's ultimate goal is to make sure that those assets can be traded in the easiest, quickest, most efficient way possible. So that's kind of how it works hand in hand. Yes, absolutely. I really, uh, personally, as a user and as a fan, as someone's part of the community, I really appreciate that, just uh, the clear thinking and just like make sure that uh, the applications are simple, make sure the transactions uh, is fast, make sure the gas fee is low. And I think all these things are really coming from, okay, cool, maybe you guys are constantly thinking about, okay, if I were the user, which I am the user, what would I and other millions other users would like to see and would like to experience uh, on a daily basis, right? So I think that is uh, super cool. You know, we got to talk about subnets, right? So how do uh, Avalanche subnets provide clients such as government agencies with the privacy, personalization, and security they required? The concept of subnets zooming out before, <clears throat> before I get to that exact yeah. answer is... The, the best analogy I, I tend to use is to simplify this concept, right? I think in our, in our ecosystem, a lot of different buzzwords tend to be used and it's almost like, well, what is actually the point of subnets? And I can, that's kind of my, my role in telling people who is, who's listening, especially those that may not be as technical. And so with subnets, all it's doing is it's making sure that the system can scale, simply put. If you pick an analogy um, that works, which is what I was referencing, you can mm -hmm. use something like the internet. Um, Web2 infrastructure to really understand why subnets are really important. So the example is, let's pick a website, google.com. Imagine if you were to scale google.com like most blockchains are scaling on one blockchain. You're then going to have a google.com where if you wanted multiple pages, you wanted different applications, you want anything other than the actual search engine, you nest it as another page within google.com backslash Uber backslash Lyft backslash all the other apps that we're probably taking for granted in terms of how easy it is, is to, it is to use in, in the Web2 context. That UX is absolutely terrible. Imagine if one domain was to take on the web traffic of all of the internet. It, it just wouldn't scale. And right. so what Web2 decided was they were saying, well, let's create domains and let's create individual IP addresses effectively where each website app whatever it may be, can be hosted on those things. And so you're distributing the load. So if one page goes down, the rest of the network is not affected. That just happens to be an app-specific issue or a tool-specific issue. So subnets are the same thing. You have the primary Avalanche platform, which right now has a lot of the ecosystem just because that's how it started. Um, mm -hmm. But anyways, point, point being, now what we're doing is moving on to saying, well, use subnets because you can still have the benefit of the Avalanche platform, but it's you can make it your own. You can set your own um, gas fees with your own protocol token, which is fantastic because you don't actually have to incur the cost of the platform, which is denominated in AVAC. So imagine if you're a project and, and you're like, a, let's say, like a gaming project and you're able to launch a subnet and use your own tokens. You don't have to generate more funds because you, you know, most of these projects have treasuries full of these tokens, right? So it's, a, mm. it's much more cost efficient. The other yeah. thing is, like I mentioned in the analogy, you're not competing with other subnets for the resources. And so you're really 
performing at your own pace. If you decide that you don't want fees, that's also fine too. That's something that you can uh, implement on your own blockchain. Now to the first part of the question related to institutions and enterprises and all these, um, I guess, like traditional entities that want to use it. The best use case that we've been talking about for years is this idea of programmable, permissioned blockchains. Hmm. Enterprises don't want to put any of their information on a public blockchain, at least at this yeah. stage. Maybe in some future, there might be a way to do it, maybe through ZKs, something like that. Um, yeah. But for now, it just doesn't make sense. So I think the walking step before you go on a jog, at least with this enterprise engagement approach, is really to say, hey, like you don't have to change your behavior. You don't have to change the way your, your databases are structured effectively. Instead, just put it on here, and then you could potentially get the benefit of interoperability with the public network while also having all of the compliance um, components integrated on chain, like KYC, AML, and those types of things. So right now, a little bit early, um, we're, we're working with a lot of different institutions and enterprises to create proof of concepts and ideate. It's really the exploratory mode. So like Deloitte yeah. is a really good example of an initiative that we did last year, a little over a year ago, where they're mm -hmm. taking the US disaster relief grants process and putting it on an avalanche instance. And then they're able to effectively, their old goal is to be able to have the nodes run by different cities or states across the country. And so it's basically like a truly a distributed ledger where you don't have to have these intermediaries verify or deny the grants process. And you can have this one single source of truth and whoever is running the node has access to that single source of truth. And so yeah. I think that's a very simple and elegant solution to making sure that you can have a very efficient database effectively of a very important, very important information. So I think that's kind of the, like one example of, of many, many types of initiatives that we're, we're tackling with, with um, subnets, but also just enterprises. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's um, <clears throat> brilliant. And it's super interesting that how you're mentioning the initiative that you guys did with Deloitte, right? And you mentioned this uh, word or phrase that is truth, which means that the data is out there on the internet and um, everybody be able to verify it. And so that doesn't necessarily have to be explained what actually have happened and where did the funds go, right? So what are your thoughts on from a philosophical uh, perspective about you know, blockchain and crypto has been and are keep going to changing our lives. Just really quick. <laughs> Just broadly. Yeah. <laughs> I I think it will change our lives tremendously somewhere, somehow. I, I I think I always get into this philosophical debate internally inside my head, also with other people, not in like saying I'm right or you're wrong, but it's always interesting to talk about different types yeah. of experiments that are happening in our space right now like i would be surprised if anyone truly knew what they were doing 100 percent of the time and that's totally okay i think that's very human to not know everything i think most innovative points there was a, a certain degree of of risk that you had to take and, and and maybe a leap of faith into the unknown and that's why i think mm -hmm. this space is so exciting to me because everyone is in agreement that fundamentally there's something amazing underlying all of this. It's this idea of disintermediation. It's this idea of empowering the individual. Also, all the other narratives that we've heard over and over and over the last, you know, over a decade, I guess, at this point. But I think what's really interesting these days is a lot of the risk and unknown gaps have shrank. So now kind of when you're looking, um, let's say like a, you pick a river narrative and, and it used to be a wide, wide river and you couldn't really see the other side. And all of a sudden you're seeing the other side and you're like, wait, I can actually see like some things over there and maybe I can maybe envision a little bit of what the future might look like. And so I think NFTs did that a lot, actually, uh, despite mm -hmm. what people may think about a lot of the things that happen. I think NFTs to me... Um, amongst a lot of different viewpoints, but one of them would be, it's kind of like a Trojan horse. It brings in digital collectibles. It brings in all these different things that people can relate to uh, without the idea of Web3 or blockchain technology or the annoying intricacies that we all have to deal with, with all the verbiage and things like that. People just kind yeah. of understand what it is. Um, and I think that was something that didn't happen in DeFi. DeFi, you had similar understandings and people that really knew or, or saw the other side of the river, taking back to the analogy. 
But the unfortunate part with DeFi is you're only addressing a tiny, tiny market of professional finance people. That market is also extremely privileged, extremely tiny, all things considered. And so to convince people about how finance works and Web3 finance is able to solve it when almost most of the world really has no idea how the system of finance works. It's, it's quite astonishing. I certainly didn't know how finance worked before I got into crypto. I had to do a ton of reading. I still do a ton of reading. I don't think I know nearly enough about it. And I think that's also why it's like such a complex area. So it's not really the best um, marketable lane, in my opinion, for DeFi, but maybe it'll s soon change because I think um, we've been chiseling away at the problem for some time. So with all this with all this uncertainty, with any vertical that we have, I think the the answer is time. So long as the fundamental understanding of, of what I mentioned before stays true, and and um, I think the the token price is really what complicates things because that emotionally um, <laughs> draws you down or brings you back up. It's, it's not necessarily the best thing to have distracting you all the time. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's I think the token price always amazing incentives but also like the same time it's like um people or ourselves to evaluate uh, i think is way too important then kind of uh could be sometime more like missing the point here but uh yeah. i totally love what you mentioned about uh comment about the nft could you share something with us about the 100 million creator fund that was announced during the avalanche summit during barcelona i know that myself and many people are super excited about that yeah, the, the quick overview on, on what the Creator Fund is, it's really trying to bootstrap the ecosystem, the NFT ecosystem with an avalanche and really trying to spur excitement around it, simply put. Now, to get a little bit deeper than that, we're partnering with an amazing project called Open, OP3N is, is how you would spell it. And Open is um, co-founded by a friend, Jason Ma. He um, comes from a music background, has a lot of experience in basically the Hollywood entertainment scene. And he identified this, this opportunity with NFTs where he was saying, well, NFTs, we could just use this as membership passes. You have all these different musicians and, and celebrities who are probably just outside the musician rung. So whether they're content creators or things like that, I think that they count as well. But mm -hmm. all these people of influence want to use this technology and want to get in on it. I think the problem with the last two years is with the Trojan horse example, people yeah. almost got a little bit too excited when they first saw the Trojan horse. They're saying like, oh, wow, this is so great. Like, this is exactly what I wanted. And those are kind of the PFP drops, I would say. It's like you you kind of saw the shiny sticker, but you didn't really take a look yeah. at the rest of the, the landscape, seeing that there's so much more out there. And and so I think utility is always kind of the, the Web3 meme, right? Everyone's always saying like, oh, yeah, well, right now, like crypto is very um, kind of like is cannibalistic where it just like... <laughs> interacts with each other. But once we find that utility, it's going to be great. And I think we're inching towards that with a few different verticals with NFTs, similar way. So the membership passes this idea of, well, what happens if you have, and taking Jason's words too, what happens if you have uh, an artist, let's say like, um, uh, like Justin Bieber, Justin Bieber has all of the complexities with publishers, music labels. It's basically a convoluted company at, at a certain degree. But what would be amazing is if you could then empower the artist to be able to talk to the fans more directly, but also make sure that the two-way street with the artist is much more seamless. So the, the fans also really get the value. And so the idea was like, let's create a system that enables anyone to be Willy Wonka and everyone can create their own chocolate factory. This is legitimately like a verbatim quote of what Jason said. And it, it actually <laughs> is a great... Yeah, great, great analogy, I, I, because then you now have, let's say you have like a $5 NFT. Those fans can have access to digital channels and, and maybe just like loose touch points where it's not too, too intimate. But if you keep going up and up and rung, like let's say you pay $10,000, maybe you could get backstage passes once a year to a Justin Bieber concert. And so now you have this interesting market that's created because you now have these assets that can be, again, tradable with anything that's on chain. So you could trade these Justin Bieber backstage tickets for maybe um, like a DeFi protocol, to like a bag of DeFi protocol tokens. That to me is so interesting of an application because now you're able to create value with other markets that didn't that didn't exist before because the interoperability, if you will, wasn't there. 
Um, mm. So open, I think the last thing I'll say about open is they're making sure that they can make the user experience as easy as possible without dealing with the blockchain complexities. Not trying to deal with the annoyances of like private key management, um, the terms that we all kind of take for granted at this point, I think, because we, we all know them pretty well. But for someone that's coming in, maybe like a Justin Bieber fan, who has no idea what crypto is, has no idea what Bitcoin is, but just wants to have that experience with that artist. Mm. They can go into open, buy a pass, nicely designed. You could also extend that experience to other anything that can be uploaded on chain. So whether it's like a mini clip of a music video or, or any of the exclusive content. So now you, now the way I see NFTs too, is it's, it's another marketing channel. For better or for worse, I definitely won't comment on that too much as, as like I have a huge bias. On, on being a marketer, but I think it's a really fascinating way to interact with your consumers. And that's where the $100 million incentive program is to incentivize those artists to come on the Avalanche and try and experiment and see if they can deploy something amazing um, for their fans effectively. And, and we have many more different initiatives that are in the pipeline that aren't public yet, but we are trying to just continue to sprint through these lanes because there's so much opportunity. It would be a a bit of a shame if we left it all on the table.